Listen now to the scripture readings for today. Just as a commentary, I was impressed that Kathy has taken on this challenge of teaching the kids all the books of the Bible. I remember learning that myself as a grade schooler, and at the time wondering why we were doing that, you know. Uh, and, and then, it, it, just last week, I had a reminder of why that can be important. If you remember, I forgot my Bible, and uh, I had to go over and get the Bible off the communion table. And unfortunately, it was the week that I had chosen to preach from Philemon, which is one page, kind of an obscure book. And I'm all of a sudden thinking, where do, am I going to, won't it be embarrassing that I have to go to the table of contents? Uh, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I've stumbled upon it and was able to, to keep going. But uh, it's uh, uh, a reminder, first of all, uh, it's good to know those kind of things. The other thing, I tell you this as a little segue, uh, it was an experience for me where, you know, here's a person who's supposed to know these things, who uh, was reminded he doesn't know all that he sometimes w wishes or thinks he knows. And uh, this is a great segue into the Nicodemus story, because Nicodemus, right, is a guy who was uh, thought to be somebody who would be in the know, and uh, he learns in this little passage he doesn't know all he thinks he knows. Uh, here it is from John 3. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? And then turning over to Paul's letter to the Philippians, remember, this is a, uh, is a time when Paul is imprisoned. He's in Rome, writing back to the church uh, a word of encouragement. And uh, you would not know from what the way Paul writes that it's most likely he was in close confinement, probably chained to a wall in this dark, dirty Roman prison because he has such an uplift in his language and in his voice. Here's what he says to the church, Philippians 3. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may obtain resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Well, today is the second installment of our little fall series that I'm calling 
the heart of Christianity, which actually is a title that I borrowed from a thoughtful book by religious scholar Marcus Bohr, The Heart of Christianity. And as that implies, the series centers around a question. What are those aspects of faith which are central to the Christian life? What gets to the heart of Christian living? Beliefs, commitments, relationships, what are the things that really do make a difference in the way we live? What's the heart of that? And heart is the right word to use here because the heart, according to the tradition and certainly according to the witness of the Bible, the heart is where God works on us, isn't it? I mean, that's where God speaks most profoundly and that's where God goes to work. It's the location uh, uh, of the locus of our biggest choices, their heart choices. It's the uh, place where our courage is summoned when we're facing some difficulty that we need to get beyond. And it's where hope takes hold and uh, lifts up our eyes at times when we might otherwise be dragged down. Uh, the, the Bible uses it that way all the time. A heart response implies our deepest response, not just a shallow intellectual assent to a question, but a, a commitment that's lived out in some way. The Bible talks about heart responses all the time. I mean, uh, it's easy to get examples of this. When Jesus was born, for instance, Luke's gospel ends the story by saying, you remember that the nativity, at the end of it, here's baby Jesus in, on Mary's lap, and Luke says, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart as if to remind all of us that it's to our hearts that uh, Jesus comes at Christmas and every other day as well. And then centuries before that, of course, Old Testament writers use heart language all the time. The proverb, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or the central law of Moses, the central commandment, hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And you may remember that once when Jesus was asked what he thought was at the center of being faithful, he quoted that very thing. He says, well, love the Lord with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he added, and your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's at the center. Everything else is just kind of window dressing. Everything else, he said, is just commentary. So what's at the heart of faith? That's where we're going these next few weeks. And today I want to suggest that one answer to that question that has been central to the faith, I think, is the notion that Christianity, first and foremost, is a religion of change and new life and the fact that people have the opportunity every day for new directions and going beyond where we are. That's a central component of Christian faith knowing that we are not defined by our past, but given new starts and the chance to move ahead. Whatever we may have done in the days gone by, whatever uh, injuries we might have had, we have the chance to start new every day in how deep our relationship with God is and how deep our relationship with each other is. Uh, and I notice Paul the Apostle went so far as to say that the capacity to put your past in the past and not let it define you, and the capacity to trust in what he called the upward call of God and to get on a line of seeing every day as a, a possibility for newness and transformation. That, in his mind, was the definition of maturity in the Christian faith. It's interesting. For Paul, the mature Christian is the one who knows that he or she is still immature, still has more growing to do. It's kind of the paradox, you know. And for Paul, nothing is more deadly than the idea that somehow you've arrived and think you know all there is to know. Uh, that he, there from his jail cell, you know, this now uh, older leader of the church has the, has the grace to say to that, uh, that community, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. And then he adds, let those of us who are mature be thus minded. So let's talk about being mature in that way. Let's talk about being open to transformation. In some Christian circles, people use the word born again or born from above or saved language to describe that. Though you will know, if you're an experienced Methodist, that we tend not to use born again and saved language all that much. 
for the very practical reason, I think, that that phrase, those two phrases, being saved or being born again, they have become, over the last, not all that long, last hundred years or so, the, that language has come to be kind of loaded language for a lot of people. It's language that sounds more divisive than inclusive. It's language that sometimes, sadly, has been used in the church to try to separate people, uh, you know, the in-group from the out-group, more than it has to bring people together. Uh, you, you, you start uh, asking people if they're born again or if they're saved, and all kinds of red flags or implied judgments start to be kind of wafting around. And my, uh, there's an old preacher's joke about the airport evangelist who approaches this harried traveler uh, as he's walking down the concourse one day and, and the evangelist buttonholes him and pulls him up close and pushes a tract in his hand and says, brother, are you saved? And, and the traveler uh, who is indignant at being stopped and, and he shoots back, sir, I'll have you know I'm an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. I've been serving churches in the United Methodist uh, denomination for more than 30 years only to hear the evangelist uh, uh, say without missing a beat, well, that's okay, you could still be saved. Uh, <laughs> we smile at that because uh, so often, I mean, it's just true, saved language or born-again language sometimes sounds like litmus test language, doesn't it? I mean, if, if the questioner is implying that if I've had the same kind of uh, ex religious experience that he or she has had, that puts me in the in-group, and if I've not, then, you know, the judgment starts to come. Well, either you have it or you're on your way to a place where you don't want to be. You're headed straight for hell. Uh, but I would suggest to you, the truth is, the Bible is filled with stories of people who find themselves transformed or saved or born again, whatever you want to say. People in the Bible get saved in an astonishing variety of ways, almost as many different ways people come to be transformed as there are people in the Bible. I mean, there are some stories of transformation that are very dramatic, and, the, and people can point to like one event where it was decisive for them. I think of Paul, you know, on the Damascus Road. Before this, he was Saul of Tarsus, the great persecutor of the church, and he has this experience where he is knocked off his horse on the Damascus Road and this vision of Jesus saying, Saul, why are you persecuting us? And he's literally blinded by that and limps into, into uh, the, the community where he's nurtured by the church, and, and he starts to, from that moment on, become a, not a persecutor, but a missionary for the church. Or, or I think of Matthew uh, leaving his tax booth, walking away from all that he had been, this cushy life, in response to a simple invitation of Jesus to come and follow. Dramatic and, and kind of an amazing thing that he would take that risk. But I want you to notice there are also gentler transformations in the Bible, gentler, more subtle ones. I think of somebody like Lydia. Do you remember the story of Lydia? In Acts 16, we read about Lydia. She was a dealer in purple fabrics, which in those days would have translated to be kind of a high-end clothier. She ran a, a, a boutique uh, for purple was the color of royalty. So Lydia, a high-end uh, fabric uh, broker in Macedonia, a big city, and she was not desperate. Uh, she was not disreputable, but a businesswoman who had standing in the community, uh, living a good and upstanding life. She was, uh, had things in many ways all together. But she meets Paul. Do you remember this story? Paul is out evangelizing, and Paul speaks to her, and she listens uh, politely. And, and she isn't wowed by Paul, but she at his request, takes him into her house and, and says, yeah, I will hear more from you. And we read of her that uh, Paul visits with her, and over time, the story says, over time, the Lord opened her heart unto the things that were said of Paul. It is to say, it was kind of gradual for her. It kind of grew on her, the Christian faith. It became something that she was willing to say, this sounds like the way of life for me. The point I just want to make is that in the Bible, not everybody finds themselves transformed in exactly the same way. And it's remarkable to see that in the, there's not a lot of judgment about that. There's not like, you know, shame on Lydia for not being like Paul. It, it, everybody needs what they need, and they come in their own time and in their own way. Uh, the way they come is different, but what they, these transformation stories have in common is that one way or another, they are 
given the opportunity to meet the living Christ, and they find in that relationship, it starts to make a difference in their attitude, in the way they look forward to the life with hope rather than despair, in their level of courage to stand up and do the right thing, and, and in the basically the sense of joy that they find in life. That's what seems to be the common thread rather than the particular way, whether it's gradual or whether it's dramatic or whether they can point to an event or, 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 or not. Uh, Nicodemus, the, the Pharisee in the Gospel reading, I think he would understand all this very well, uh, that not everybody comes to faith in the same way. Nicodemus is the one who came to Jesus under the cover of darkness one evening in order to have a conversation. And we don't know this for sure, but I think it's a very good bet that when Nicodemus came into this little campsite where Jesus and the disciples were staying, he assumed that this was going to be just a little friendly, non-threatening exchange of ideas between two people who were religiously inclined. I mean, Nicodemus was not used to thinking of himself as somebody who needed to change at all. In fact, he was at a place in his culture where he was thought of to be one of the people who had arrived, spiritually speaking. He was one of the Sanhedrin, one of the elite 70 elected leaders uh, to the Jewish court. I mean, basically, that's what the Sanhedrin was. It was the preeminent governing body in both religious and civil matters in the community. And, and Nicodemus was one of the 70 elected to be on that court, which was a highly respected position. Somebody who was on that court would be assumed to be smart and uh, used to living a life of faith and used to being kind of, you know, in the know when it comes to both general wisdom and religious wisdom. And so uh, here comes Nicodemus, this respected man, somebody assumed to be uh, in the know. Uh, when he shows up, it may be no surprise that the first words out of his mouth when he meets Jesus at this campsite, it's not a question or, or a request to learn. Instead, Nicodemus shows up at camp that night with a statement about how much he knows. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do the things that you do unless God were with him. We already know about you, Jesus, and what we hear has been quite impressive, to tell you the truth. So can you and I, this evening, around the campfire, just have a little visit? Two teachers who are in the know on important matters, like we are. And I would love to have seen the look on his face, wouldn't you, when uh, Jesus makes a response, and in the response, it becomes very clear that Jesus doesn't think Nicodemus is in the know at all. In fact, uh, he hasn't even gotten on the right page yet. Truly I tell you, unless a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Which, I mean, if I were going to give it, you know, the, the von Hoffman central Illinois paraphrase, I would paraphrase it something like, Nicodemus, you don't know nearly as much as you think you know. Nobody can know what is possible with God unless they are willing to be changed in their relationship and, and, and become more deeply centered in God. It's like being born a second time. It's like being born from above. And what's very interesting to me, anyway, is that Nicodemus, this man who does know a lot, I mean, obviously he does, he is completely bewildered by that challenge that Jesus gives him. He takes Jesus metaphor, and it is a metaphor being born from above, it's poetry, and he completely misses the point. I guess, incidentally, if you've ever wished for a scripture passage that you could point to, to your fundamentalist aunt, as an illustration as to why you don't take everything in the Bible literally, here's your chance, right here. Think about this. Here is, Jesus has just said to Nicodemus, unless you're born from above, you can't enter the kingdom of God, and Nicodemus goes all literal on him and misses the point entirely. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And, you, you know, Jesus, you can almost picture him shaking his head and saying, you know, you don't get it. <laughs> you don't get it. Nicodemus, it's like this. The, the, the wind of the spirit, the spirit of transformation, it's like the wind. The wind blows where it wills and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes or where it will push you. So it is with everybody who is born of the Spirit. 
That's what Jesus says in response. And I want you to notice what that invitation has in it. I mean, it's Jesus' invitation to Nicodemus to, to, to see his religion in a much more free and less rule-bound way. I mean, Nicodemus is the master. He is the, the authority on a religion that is steeped in keeping rules. And, and he, in fact, that's why he's on the court. I mean, he's the rule enforcer. And here he is coming to meet this young rabbi, thinking he probably would be the expert and Jesus the student, and, and the tables are turned, and Jesus is now challenging him to worry less about rules and keeping them rigidly and more worried about relationship. How connected to God am I? How much am I loving God and responding to God out of my desire to please God, out of love, rather than out of fear that if I break the rule, the hammer is going to come down. I mean, that's the, that's the invitation at its heart. Be more worried about your relationship with God, being born into a new family and attentive to that, and less worried about the rules. Put your focus on the spirit, the wind that blows gently all around you. When I read that passage, I think of the, the famous... Uh, quote from G.K. Chesterton, who said, I live by the motto, take yourself lightly so that like angels you may fly. And I think that's kind of the invitation Jesus is giving to Nicodemus here. Take yourself a little less seriously and be more open to the way in which that spirit is inviting you to take hold of life and to see it as wonderful and more of an adventure to be celebrated than a, a, a bunch of rules to be kept. And, uh, you know, by the end of the story, we're left wondering, uh, what's gonna ha what will Nicodemus do with this? Will he lighten up a little bit and take himself less seriously and let this more free-spirited approach to faith kind of be born in him? A and uh, we don't know. We're just left hanging. All we know is that at the end of the story, Nicodemus' confidence about all he knew, that has now melted away. And all he can say is, how can this be? We're just left hanging, whether he'll change or whether he'll go back to his old life. But I have to say, thankfully, this is, there's a little bit in John's Gospel, this is one of those Paul Harvey moments. If you're of my age or older, you'll remember Paul Harvey he used to have, tell stories and then he'd say, now you, let me tell you the rest of the story. Because in John's Gospel, there is a rest of the story about Nicodemus. It, it appears much later in the Gospels. Uh, actually, uh, clear at the end, John 19. That's the, the next time and only time we hear back from Nicodemus. And you remember, John 19 is the story of Good Friday. Jesus has been executed, and virtually everybody who has been a follower of Jesus has headed for the hills. They're scared to death. They don't want their fate to be the same as they've just seen happen to Jesus. And so they have all escaped. The disciples have all run off. Uh, and deserted him, uh, and there's nobody left except some of the women who were courageous enough to stay, and one man. Remember who? Nicodemus, yeah. It's Nicodemus on Good Friday, who is the one person who hasn't run off and goes to the foot of the cross, and at great personal risk to himself, remember he's part of the, the in-group, the Sanhedrin, uh, he's the one who goes to Pilate and says, I would want to claim his body and anoint it for burial. And, and so he does. Great, great risk he takes in all of that. There at the foot of the cross, Nicodemus reappears. And, and this time he's no longer a bystander. He's not a visitor. Uh, he's not somebody who's, who's smug in what he knows. He is now a servant. He comes transformed. He's doing what he can there. Uh, there's none of that we know stuff going on and if no false confidence. There is only this kind of twofold aspect. There's, there's courage and there is kind of humble devotion. He will do now what he can for this Lord who has changed his life uh, and um, given everything for the sake of the world. I don't think it's any accident that John brought Nicodemus back and reminded us of what he did in that little detail on Good Friday. I think it's John's way of saying that's what a transformed life, a, a born-again life, however you want to say it, a saved life, that's what it looks like. When you leave behind the sort of religion that Nicodemus once had, 
you know, which was safe and it was secure and it was steeped in, in what you think you know. And you take on a new identity as somebody who experiences the wind of God directing you at life. It's sometimes blowing you even to tough places that you would rather avoid. In this case, you know, claiming Jesus' body at the foot of the cross. Uh, you've heard me say before, but I think it's true. I, I, it's a quote from Fred Craddock. He says, sometimes the longest journey a person can take is the 18 inches between your head and your heart. And I think exactly that's where religion has moved from Nic for Nicodemus, from a religion of knowing and keeping rules to a religion of heart that says, sometimes you just have to step up and be courageous and trust God to be with you in that, and now is my time. And, and for him, you know, that's what new birth is all about, and I think it's true for us as well. You see it all the time if you look closely. People living with a heart of faith that is both one at the same time, both joyful in the sense that life is an adventure and uh, challenging in that that adventure sometimes calls us to be brave and find a place to serve, you know. I love it when volunteers come back from our mission trips and, and say, you know, like as they did last year from the Nicaragua construction trip, boy, it's hard, but we can't wait to get back. We're almost done with that fence. We can't wait to get back and finish it. Or you hear people in our prayer shawl ministry, you know, they go deliver one of those hand-knitted shawls that they so quietly and, and faithfully uh, create and pray over, and they, they take it to people who are sick or people in need, and you'll hear them say, it's amazing to us, it's a God thing, how often when we deliver those things, it feels like somebody will say to us, this is exactly what I needed today. I was feeling low, and I just needed somebody to respond. Thank you, it makes all the difference to me. I mean, in ways like that, I think, you know, which are, are not dramatic in and of themselves, that's how the wind of the Spirit of God works. And, and, and you can know. Uh, you see it by its effects, Jesus says. It blows where it wills. You, you hear the sound. You don't know where it comes or whether it goes. How do you know what the wind is doing? You see its effects. You see what it moves. And, and I think in just those ways, new birth happens in the lives of individuals. It's just those everyday changes and our everyday efforts God uses to literally make all things new. And it's one of the hallmarks of our faith, the cultivation of a heart not filled with smugness, but filled with love. Amen.